Uh, hi, I'm Skinny Cheeks, and this is my Arcanist DPS guide for the Elder Scrolls Online. I'll go through some general setups as well as some more specialized setups, including some for the Infinite Archive. I did a guide for the Archive as well. If you want to check that out, I'll have it linked in the description below. Starting off with the attributes, I recommend going 64 points into Stamina. You can go all into Magicka as well, and the build still works, but I found that going into Stamina seems to be much easier to sustain and has a little bit higher damage ceiling as well due to certain gear options that we'll talk about a little bit later. Ultimately, both routes are viable, but currently as of update 40, 64 into Stamina is optimal. The new addition of the Infinite Archive does shake this up a bit. If you are aiming to push far in there, you will want to put some points into Health. When exactly you make this change is up to you, but usually around arc 7 or so is when I'll move my points from stamina into health. If you need them a little sooner or think you can hold off a little bit later, that's totally up to you. I'm usually running in duos, so if you're running solo, you might want to put them in just from the beginning. But at some point, that extra health is going to be crucial to keep pushing. For the top races, nothing has really changed here in quite some time. You can really go with any race in the game and complete all levels of content. These are just some examples of the top options from a pure DPS perspective. For the Mundus Stone, typically we'll be going with the Thief for Dungeons and Trials. For the Infinite Archive, I usually still go with the Thief, but for certain setups, you might want to go with the Lady if you are planning on pushing far. You can get to that resistance cap of 33k without the Lady, but some builds might work better by using that to get there than through some other means. You will want to hit the cap in the Archive one way or another if you are pushing far into it. My build that I'll show a little bit later for pushing far does not need the Lady to hit that 33k mark, but if you are doing something a little different, you might. It's just something to keep in mind there. But for most scenarios, the Thief is our go-to to get the most damage. For our consumables, we'll start out by talking about the food and drinks. I'm going to talk about these from a stamina-based perspective, but just keep in mind there are Magicka versions of all of these as well if you are going that route. The most common food I run on my Arcanist is the typical blue bystat food with health and stamina. This just gives a ton of both of those resources, and since sustain on the Arcanist is really good, you typically don't need to worry about having a food with recovery on it. If you are super confident in not dying for whatever activity that you're doing, or you are on the trial dummy or something, the max stamina green food does offer slightly more damage since you get a tiny bit more stamina out of it. But you don't get any health there, so usually I wouldn't recommend that for harder content. Now you might start sensing a theme here, but the infinite archive does shake things up a bit. I found myself using some recovery foods a little bit more in there, such as Orzorga's Smoked Bear Haunch or Artaeum Takeaway Broth. These are both pretty expensive though, so you can go with dubious Camoran throne if you want a cheaper option that has a little bit lower stats. And the reason I end up using these sometimes, even though the Arcanist has good sustain, is that in the archive I'll often change my potions up to ones that don't have any sustain on them. And so then depending on what visions I've picked up along the way in the archive, if I didn't get any good sustain ones, changing this up might hurt my sustain too much, and so I'll need to make some of that up with a food or drink choice. But this is just a bit situational here. A lot of times in the archive I'm still just running the buy stat food. So I did mention potions here, so let's talk about some of the different options that we might be running for different scenarios. Typically, for most encounters, I'm going to be running the Tri Resource Return Potions that give back health, magicka, and stamina, and it also boosts those recoveries by 30%. You can craft these or just use the daily login reward versions. They're both identical, so it really doesn't matter there. If those are a little too rich for your blood or you don't have the daily login reward ones, you can usually get by in most content just using the Trash Stamina Return Potions that you find off a mobs, or even Trash Magicka Return. I typically won't run these for harder content, but if I'm just blasting through a random normal daily or something and don't want to waste expensive potions, sometimes I'll just slot these instead. If I'm in a scenario where the group is being a bit more sweaty and we're really trying to push things as high as possible, the Heroism Potions are a great option. You still get your resource return, but also a good amount of extra ultimate return as well to crank out ults a little bit faster. These are really expensive, so I don't slot them for more casual runs, but if you have the gold to do so, these will typically get you the highest DPS results possible. And then finally for the archive, once I have a couple of buffs going to my recoveries through the visions, I'll swap over to the resistance potions. These add a ton of extra physical and spell resistance, making it a lot easier to hit that 33k resistance cap that we talked about earlier. They do have the downside of not having any stamina or magicka resource recovery on them, so that's why I brought up those alternative food options in the last section. You may need to swap to one of those to use these, 
especially if you haven't found any of those resource recovery buffs from the archive visions. You could use these outside of the archive as well, but sustaining them will be pretty tough without those visions. Definitely could be doable though for shorter encounters. And then finally, a pretty niche option that I sometimes use for short burst scenarios. We have the Lingering Ravage Health Potions. These will actually cause you to deal damage to yourself, which has a few other applications too, but the main one I'm using them for is pairing with the set Mechanical Acuity. This will help us build up our stacks of that a little more easily to get a nice period of 100% crit chance. And for this type of use, you'll want to do these as low level potions so that you aren't dealing as much damage to yourself with them. Not really super necessary for a burst build but you can use them and get really good results paired with mechanical acuity and it just adds a little bit of oomph to that setup to make sure you're hitting the five stacks of that just make sure you are only using these for a short burst encounter because you'll be giving up a lot of other things you could have on your potions that these don't offer and then finally, if you need help making any of these, UESP has a really great alchemy calculator. I use it all the time just to double check what ingredients I need to use if I'm not in the game or whatnot. So definitely recommend checking that out. All right, now I'll go through the champion points. Arcanist has it the easiest of all the classes as you don't really have to change much to always sit close to max damage. You'll pretty much always have Biting Aura and Thaumaturge slotted for the boost to your beam damage. And then Wrathful Strikes is typically going to be slotted as well to boost all of your damage. That fourth slot's where you'll typically change things up depending on the situation, though the difference in the various options is not huge. First off, you could do Fighting Finesse or Backstabber here if you are coming up short of the crit damage cap of 125%. If you're way short, you could also slot both and drop Wrathful Strikes. Another option is to run the Exploiter node. This gives a 10% damage boost to enemies that are off balance. This makes it excellent for short burst scenarios when you have this debuff up, but even for longer encounters, if your crit damage is already in hand, so you don't need the crit damage nodes, as long as someone in your group is applying off balance, then it is a really strong option for that fourth slot. Off balance lasts for seven seconds, and then it goes for 15 seconds before it can trigger again. So it's up for seven out of every 22 seconds if it's kept up perfectly meaning about a 3.2% damage boost averaged out. But this doesn't tell the whole story as you can cleverly use ultimates and your beam during this window to skew that a bit more in favor of the exploiter node. For the trial dummy, you will commonly see the slotted since that seven seconds up and 15 seconds down is consistent throughout the entire dummy fight. And you'll see players that really push damage to the max trying to use their ultimates during this window. Another option I see sometimes if your crit damage is taken care of, but there is no off balance present, untamed aggression. This one isn't anything too flashy, but a little bit of extra damage that applies to everything. So it's a nice safe option to go with that will consistently get good results. For the infinite archive, you may change things up a bit here if you're wanting to push really high and go with some of the more defensive options. You don't necessarily need to hard swap everything over to these, but maybe work them in slowly as you are pushing up to sure up some of your defenses. You might also swap your biting aura to deadly aim for the single target damage. This is definitely archive specific here since there is an incredibly strong vision in there to boost your status effect damage. And if you stack up enough of these, your single target will be a good bit higher than your AOE even for the Arcanist. But outside of the archive, that Biting Aura, Thaumaturge, Wrathful Strikes, plus one of those other nodes we talked about is generally always the play. All right, now we'll cover all of the gear options. There are a lot of great combos that work, but these will just be a few of my favorites. The most common for top end DPS is a one piece slime crawl, which has the highest crit chance of any one piece monster set in the game. Our one piece mythic will be Velothi Urmage's amulet. This is perfect for the Arcanist as the missing light attack damage is not a big deal since we already aren't light attacking as much due to our long channel time on our beam. And then for the five piece sets, we have Coral Riptide and Deadly Strike. Coral Riptide gives us a really high amount of weapon and spell damage based on our missing stamina and deadly strike adds 15% damage to our channels and dots which will account for most of our damage then we have the maelstrom staff on the back bar this is really nice to add a lot of aoe damage and since it is magicka based it also helps us to comfortably keep our stamina low for coral riptide for the enchantments you'll go all stamina on the body if your attributes are in stamina weapon and spell damage on the jewelry flame enchantment on the main hand poison enchantment on the offhand and a weapon damage glyph on the back bar weapon 
for traits, divines on the body pieces, bloodthirsty on the jewelry, infused on the back bar weapon, and then nern honed on the main hand, and then precise or charged on the offhand. If you are in a single target focused encounter, charge seems to have a little higher upside for the extra status effect damage, but for more AoE heavy stuff, I prefer precise for the extra crit chance. Now, this is just one way that you can set up. It's definitely not the only route to getting great DPS. One thing you'll notice a lot on the really high end trial dummy parses is that they use Pillar of Nern instead of Deadly Strike. Pillar of Nern is still a really strong option for single target damage, but I never really use it in actual content because Deadly Strike is just about even with Pillar for single target, but way stronger for AoE damage. So I would definitely recommend Deadly Strike there in almost all cases, but Pillar can still be a very good single target option if you want to use it. Now, I know a lot of you out there don't like the resource management mini game of Coral Riptide. First off, I'd say give it a shot if you have the gear and you haven't yet, because it actually isn't too hard to keep your stamina down on the Arcanist if you dump it before the fight. But if you're like me, sometimes I just don't want to mess with that. I just want to relax and play. And Onsoul's Torment is a really great option for that. I think this one gets a bit undersold on how strong it actually is. One thing I found out in the past couple of months is that that 7% damage bonus on the five piece is actually a multiplicative damage done and not additive like most percent damage done bonuses. This actually makes it a good bit stronger than what a lot of people initially calculated. It isn't as strong as Coral, but it it isn't that far off a lot closer than people might realize. One reason I think people often underestimate it is because of trial dummy tests. For one, the line of penetration is completely wasted on the trial dummy, whereas for most players that would absolutely be useful in real content, and penetration lines when benefited from are very strong in ESO. Another thing is that on the dummy with Coral, it is extremely easy to sit right at or below that 33% stamina mark where the bonus is maxed out. However, in actual content, while it isn't difficult to keep your stamina low on the Arcanist, there typically will be a bit more fluctuation, and unless you are really well practiced at that particular encounter, you likely won't be able to keep it in this range perfectly for the whole fight like you could on a trial dummy. And then lastly, another thing that doesn't show up on the dummy is the potential for another 7% damage done when getting an interrupt. This is not usually a super consistent thing that you can keep up. The uptimes are generally very low or not there at all, depending on the fight. However, it does add in some damage that you don't see in the head-to-head -head dummy comparisons. Not to mention there are some encounters, especially solo or small group stuff, where you might actually get a lot of interrupts. So all of that to say, between the penetration line being wasted on the dummy, Coral being kept up perfectly, on the dummy in those really high parses you see, and the potential for more damage with interrupts, all of these things make Onsoul really, really close to Coral Riptide and might even be a better option for you depending on your scenario and skill level. I use Onsoul all the time in real content and I get really good results with it. So don't sleep on that just because it doesn't quite hang with Coral Riptide on the trial dummy. All of that said, Coral does have the higher upside in an optimized scenario. And then all of these setups can be run with different back bar weapons as well. Maelstrom Staff is really common, but Black Rose Prison Dual Wield is another one that works really well in the back bar. This pairs nicely with the 1.5 bar setup that we'll go through later for the skills section. I know a lot have reached out and they've really liked this setup because of the timer lengths on the skills. It makes it pretty easy to manage. It's really strong. It adds in a bit more tankiness as well. So just another option, but I do have these and other options listed on my website at skinnycheeks.gg. So if you want to dig a little deeper beyond my top few favorites here maybe check that out to get some more ideas but I will still go through a few more options here. For those that don't have access to any trial sets yet, a great combo would be Orders, Wrath, and Deadly Strike. No need to farm anything here except for the Mythic and that One Piece monster set, which you can get really easily. And then you can craft or purchase Orders, Wrath, and you can purchase Deadly Strike. So it's a really easy combo to put together. So one nice thing about the Arcanist is that you can really run the same setup for a whole dungeon or trial encounter and get great results all the way through. And this isn't really the case with a lot of classes. A lot of them are very single target or AOE heavy depending on their setups and they don't really work well for both. You kind of have to swap back and forth. But for Arcanist, it doesn't really matter much if it's a boss or trash or single target or AOE fight. The main setup you use will be really strong for all of it. That's really one of the biggest strengths to the Arcanist, especially on console where swapping gear is a bit more of a chore without add-ons to quickly do it like on PC. However, if you are wanting to dig a little deeper and optimize for other types of scenarios, 
videos, I do have a few more setups here for you. First off, for AoE trash encounters, I really like the Sulkson plus Deadly Strike combo. This gives us a bunch of extra crit chance and crit damage from Sulkson to go with our stronger channel and dot skills from Deadly Strike. Just really strong on trash where you can reliably have enemies dying to keep up that Sulkson bonus. And I'll generally go precise here on that offhand instead of charge since it is more AoE heavy. Another really great option for AoE damage is to run the Azerblight set. This thing is pretty strong even with just two consistent enemies in the encounter, but if you get beyond that, the damage from it starts to get pretty crazy. For boss type stuff, I'll usually front bar Coral Riptide or Onsel with it. Both are great options with the same pros and cons that we discussed earlier. This will generally be the exception where you'd front bar these sets. Most of the time you'd have them as always active types of sets, but Azerblight is preferred to be always active in this pairing here, so that's why we are front barring Coral Riptide or Onsel. You can also do Whirl of the Depths or Yon Deer's Might here with Azerblight. I've gotten great results with both of these as well. So a few good options here to go with for these AoE heavy scenarios. Again though, Coral does have the highest upside of these. Next up, if you really want to optimize around short burst damage for specific scenarios where you know you'll be dropping your ultimate, I have a few nice setups for that as well. And I definitely use some of these in the infinite archive for bosses where I'm pretty confident that I can burst them down quickly. So first up would be this one here, Balorg for the monster set, just a really strong option for short burst since it gives a ton of weapon and spell damage and penetration based on how much ultimate you spend. And then we'll be front barring the mechanical acuity set. This will give us a short duration where we are critting on nearly every tick then a four piece yondir's might so we will have more weapon and spell damage but also that really strong five piece damage done bonus from minor slayer on the three piece then we have the maelstrom staff again on the back bar this is nice for aoe burst if you are doing single target bursts you could also do the master's bow here instead but i usually just have this set up with the maelstrom staff so this is just one option there for a nice burst setup another is to use war machine instead of yondir then we move it around a little bit we'll have the full five piece bonus active on our back bar for that set. I really like this one in the infinite archive because we generally won't have another source of major slayer and this will provide that bonus to us when we use our ultimate on the back bar. So the rest of the gear is pretty much the same. Essentially if you don't have major slayer provided use this setup but if you do then use the one we talked about right before this. And then finally we have a little bit more niche setup but I've gotten good results with this one too. It's using elf bane on the back bar instead of war machine. This extends the length of our flame damage over time abilities by five seconds. This is really nice when you pair it with a Fiery Rage ultimate. Now, in a lot of situations, you won't be using that since our Unblinking Eye ult is really good even for AoE damage. But this one is really nice for short bursts that might take just a tad bit longer. You still don't want to use it on an encounter that is really long, but something around like 15 seconds or so seems to be a really sweet spot for this set since your Fiery Rage Destro ultimate is increased to 12 seconds long with Elfbane. This is especially strong in the Archive if you get the bonus to your weapon weapon skills, so if I get that verse for a boss fight, I usually feel very confident about using this setup and I'll switch to the Fiery Rage ultimate and quickly burst down the boss. Now for a one bar setup, there are quite a few good combos that you can go with. I definitely recommend to go with Deadly Strike as one of them, but then after that, you're pretty open. Pillar of Nern would be a strong one for bosses. Could also go Order's Wrath here as well for nice consistent damage added to everything. I generally recommend the Oaken Soul Mythic for one bar setups as the defensive buffs are pretty nice too. But if you find yourself with a lot of the buffs from Oaken Soul already present in your setup, you could get higher results with Velothi even on a one bar build. So that's that's just something to keep in mind when you're putting this setup together. All right, next up for the Infinite Archive, I usually swap over from Velothi to Pale Order at about Arc 4 or so in a duo group. You could probably hold off longer, but it just makes it really easy to stay healed up if you have Pale Order on, as you will start taking a little bit more damage after Arc 4 or so. If you are going solo, you could just start with this on right away if you want to. So starting out early in the archive, I pretty much use all these setups that we already talked about. I use the main one for the longer boss fights, the trash one with Sulkson for the ad waves, the burst builds for the short fights. Really not a lot has changed from what I would use in other areas of the game because we haven't really built up a lot of those visions yet. And the incoming damage is not anything too crazy yet either. For later in the archive though, I will share a build that I've really enjoyed. I used up to arc 14. This is what I swapped to once I have a good amount of damage from my vision 
provisions already and I need a good bit of tankiness to keep going. So we'll have the Pale Order Mythic here to keep those heals incoming. And then we have a one piece monster set. You can do slime crawl for the damage, but this is flexible depending on what you feel like you are lacking. And then I'm doing the Black Rose Prison Dual Wield. This is really nice for that extra 6% damage reduction. It also gives you 6% damage increase as well. So between that and the major evasion that is on Quick Cloak, really nice mitigation all packed into one skill. For the five piece sets, I'm running Vroll's Command on the back bar and three heavy body pieces. So this helps me get to the resistance cap as well as giving minor Aegis on that three piece bonus for the 5% damage taken reduction and then major Aegis on the five piece for 10%. And what I really like is that that 10% goes to both of you in a duo. So if you aren't running with a DK tank doing the permanent magma shell stuff, it's really beneficial for both of you. In my run, for example, I was running with Code who was on a Nightblade tank. So we were both able to get an extra 10% less damage taken. The nice thing is that this extends with the vision called Extended Favor. So after just one of these, you can have almost 100% uptime. I ended up with four of them on my last run. And so my roll lasted for 42 seconds whenever I did a heavy attack. This is a pretty easy buff to keep up since ads have that small window when they spawn in where they aren't doing anything yet. And you can just heavy attack to proc this and then you're good to go for quite a long time. For the other five piece set to pair it with, this will kind of depend on what your other visions are looking like. A nice default would be to just have Onsoul or Deadly Strike there for the damage increases. But if you've gotten quite a few of the attuned enchantments vision, Heartland Conqueror is really good too. This will increase all of your weapon traits by 100%. So typically you'll use that with Infuse to really boost those enchantments that are already increased by the vision. The charge trait can work really well too for the extra status effect chance. There is some flexibility here for the enchantments, but the five that I think are the most useful are weapon damage, poison, try restoration, weakening, and the hardening damage shield enchantment. Typically we'll only have room for three of these though. So depending on if you're solo or with a partner, you might want to coordinate how you set that up. So for example, if your tank is running weakening, then you might end up going with weapon damage, poison, and the try restoration. But for solo, maybe you'd want the weapon damage, the shield, and the weakening. Another really popular option here I've seen people doing is Torg's Pack, kind of for the same reasons as Heartland. It's also a really popular combo to have both of those together for solo play. You'll get some ridiculously high values on your enchantments. I've also seen some people running Serpent's Disdain and doing really well with that. Seems like it could be really consistent damage for you when you have those high status effect visions. And then again, this build is archive specific. I do have a guide out that goes a little bit deeper into some of the nuances of the infinite archive. So make sure to check that one out if you do want some more info on that. All right, next up, we'll go through the skills. For most encounters, this is kind of the base for what I run. For the front bar, Camouflage Hunter for the crit chance and the 3% weapon and spell damage for it being a Fighter's Guild ability. Blade Cloak here for the major evasion for 20% reduced damage taken from AoEs. And also it has the ability to proc your enchantment so that will keep your status effect damage high while you're beaming and you can't light attack. Both morphs are really good here. Deadly Cloak lasts for 20 seconds and does a bit higher DPS, but Quick Cloak has a nice burst of speed when you hit it and it's actually really good for a lot of encounters especially in the archive even though the dps is a little bit lower from the skill itself since it lasts for 30 seconds you actually get pretty similar damage output overall for longer encounters since you can spend a little bit more time beaming rather than refreshing the skill but for really short stuff deadly cloak is more damage for sure either option is great though it won't really make a big difference so it's up to you here which morph you want to go with next we have barb trap it's a really nice dot the damage from the skill itself is not anything too impressive but the high chance for it to proc the hemorrhaging status effect makes it one of the best single target dots in the game it's also a fighter's guild skill so like camo hunter this gives us another three percent weapon and spell damage just for slotting it and then we have cephaliarch's flail this one is a really important skill as it builds up our crux and it also puts a damage taken debuff on enemies hit with it and it also has a nice heal when we use it it's just a great skill must have in the kit and then when our our crux is at the full three stacks we'll dump it with the next skill fate carver so both morphs of this are really good and get really high dps the pragmatic morph is slightly behind the exhausting morph for damage but it comes with a really strong damage shield every time that you use it so for the infinite archive or other activities where you're trying to play a bit more safely then pragmatic is definitely the way to go but if you do want to push dps just a little bit higher exhausting is a bit better since the beam lasts for one second 
longer. Then for our front bar ultimate, we'll typically be using the flawless Dawnbreaker ability. This is mostly just here because it is a fighter skilled skill and we get 3% more weapon and spell damage, but you can cast it in a pinch if you don't think you'll have time to build up for your unblinking eye ultimate, since this one here is a little bit cheaper. It does a little damage, but then it adds in 300 weapon and spell damage for 20 seconds when you use it. So like I said, it can be nice in a pinch towards the end of a fight. For our back bar, the first slot here will be a flex spot. If you are just going for pure damage, you'll generally have camo hunter slotted here for the consistent crit chance buff on both of your bars. However, since we spend a lot less time on our back bar, it isn't a huge loss if you need to use this slot for something else like a defensive buff, crux weaver armor, rune guard of freedom, impervious rune ward, and echoing vigor are all some common defensive options I use on my arcanist depending on different situations. And sometimes even a combo of two of these together with one of them in that final flex spot. All right, next up we have Elemental Blockade. This will be Fiery Blockade with the Flame Staff. Really strong AOE damage with that Maelstrom Staff, and it keeps up our weapon damage enchantment from our back bar. Fulminating Rune is the next skill here. Just a nice dot that spreads to nearby enemies. It also explodes at six seconds, dealing a fair amount of extra damage. But one of the best parts of this skill and why it is a must run for group play is that it offers three players the ability to activate the Rune Break synergy, which will add a ton of group DPS. So you definitely want to have at least a few of these going, but usually just always slotted for group content for Arcanist DPS. Next, we'll have Inspired Scholarship. This is a really strong skill. It lasts for 30 seconds so it's super easy to keep up and it not only adds in a good bit of extra damage but it helps us to build crux faster so that typically we'll only have to flail twice to build to three crux stacks instead of flailing three times. This feature ends up adding in a good bit of extra damage since we spend more time beaming but that isn't all. We also have the major sorcery and brutality for having it slotted and this effect is active on both of our bars not just on our back bar. So this is just really a must-have skill overall for Arcanist DPS. I never take this one off. And then we have another flex spot. You could use any of those skills mentioned earlier in that first flex spot, or you could go more offensive here. I will often run Scalding Rune or Caltrops here for the extra damage. I really like Caltrops here a lot, especially if I'm running Azerblight, since that ticks in a fairly nice size AoE every second, whereas many other dots, such as Scalding Rune, only tick it once every two seconds. And then finally for our ultimate, we'll almost always be running that Unblinking Eye ultimate. Both morphs are really strong. The Languid Eye is a little more burst since this one comes out in six seconds whereas Tide King's Gaze lasts for eight seconds and Languid deals a tiny bit more damage in total as well though both are actually fairly close in total damage when you factor in those two extra seconds that Tide King's Gaze gets. Tide King will also follow the enemy around instead of being cast on a location so you have to have an enemy targeted in order to cast it. Can be nice if you're not super sure of stack points or if you think that enemies might be moving a little more you don't end up wasting some ticks from your languid eye where the enemy moved out of it so both are really good options i use both of them depending on what scenario so really up to you here which one you want to go with and then sometimes i will use fiery rage here this goes really well with that elf bane setup i mentioned earlier to get a nice long 12 second fiery rage ultimate the other one i might slot here is meteor only if i'm in the infinite archive i won't really do it outside of that there is a vision in there that boosts your guild skill damage and so casting a meteor instead of the eye could be a bit more damage in those particular encounters. For other weapon types, if you want to run the bow on your back bar, you'll swap your blockade for endless hail, and then that final flex spot for poison injection if you are running the master's bow. If you're doing a different bow, such as maelstrom bow, you don't necessarily have to run poison injection, and that becomes a flex spot again. Two-handed is not as commonly run on the arcanist back bar, but it is doable for most content if you just like the theme of it better. You'll have stampede and carve in those two slots, and then the rest of the build stays the same. For dual wield on the back bar, this one I really enjoy as it leaves us on our front bar a ton and gives us a lot of flexibility when setting up our back bar skills. This is the one we've been referring to as that 1.5 bar build because our two main back bar skills are both 30 seconds long. So this leaves us to spend most of our time on our front bar and only have to go back there to refresh those every so often. It also opens us up to use a staff on the front bar as well if you want to go that route over dual wield. I'd prefer a flame staff in that scenario. So you might keep fulminating rune 
on your back bar if you do the flame staff on the front bar and run a flame skill like elemental susceptibility or elemental blockade on your front bar. Really, there's some good options there, but you really have a lot of flexibility to set it up how you need it. And then the Black Rose Prison Dual Wield on the back bar can get you a lot of extra tankiness with that 6% damage taken reduction, while also still keeping a strong amount of offensive power since it gives you 6% damage done as well. So not only is this a little bit easier to set up, but it's a little tankier and it's still really good damage too. For the infinite archive, my sort of default loadout would look something like this. I usually have the two defensive skills going on the back bar to help with survival. Then once I get enough status effect damage, I'll often go with elemental susceptibility over fulminating rune. You can also drop trap at some point for revealing flare to get major protection. You'll still want hemorrhaging going though, because it deals a lot of damage, especially if you have the status effect visions. So you'll want to make sure you have a source of that, like the ferocious support from your heavy attack attacks. This vision here will add in bleed damage to your heavy attacks, which will also proc hemorrhaging. It will be a little bit of a damage loss over trap to slot the major protection from revealing flare here for sure. But with the build I have for late in the archive, having this here will give you both major and minor protection and major and minor Aegis. So a total 40% damage reduction just from those named buffs. Not to mention Black Rose Prison Dual Wield adding more. Our resistances being capped. It's just overall super tame. And then there are definitely other combos you can go with. This is just what worked well for me. It got me really far into the archive and the fights continued to go at reasonable speeds, even building super tanky. But I definitely recommend joining the Discord server if you are looking to discuss setups to push far into the archive. Lots of people in there that have a lot of experience in the archive and many having top leaderboard positions for various classes. And then finally, this is the skill bar setup for the one bar build. Not really changing here from the initial version from when the Arcanist was released, still the same core skills with Trap and Blade Cloak being the flex spots. Those are nice for damage and Blade Cloak is good for survival as well, but you can feel free to swap these for any skills you feel are more important for the particular encounter that you're working through. All right, for this section of the video, we'll briefly go through how we open up and do our combat rotation. It's pretty much the standard for any class to cast any abilities that don't require a target and won't initiate combat right before the encounter begins. So in this case, we have our Inspired Scholarship, Crux Weaver Armor, Rune Guard of Freedom, and Quick Cloak. These are all cast on us so we can pre-cast them. The one exception here is that if you are using Black Rose Prison Dual Wield, this does require Quick Cloak or Dead cloak to be cast while you are in combat for the set to activate. So you'll want to save that as the last pre-buff skill for right as the enemy is engaged and combat has begun. But then after that, it's pretty straightforward. We put down all of our other dots that do initiate combat, make sure that we're flailing enough to get to the three crux stacks, which should usually only be twice due to inspired scholarship generating crux. And then while our dots are gone, we just beam. If you think your dots might run off a little bit while you're beaming, it usually isn't a huge deal. Most of the time, it's better to just go ahead and beam and then recast them a couple of seconds late rather than prolong the beam and recast those dots early. That said, if a dot is going to run out right as you start beaming or a second after, maybe go ahead and recast it in that situation, especially if it's an important one like your blockade on your back bar that's going to keep up your weapon damage enchantment. And then our Crux Weaver armor, if we are running that, will also generate Crux for us when we take damage. So sometimes we'll actually only need to flail once before we we beam again if you have that skill running. So we'll get one from our Inspired Scholarship, another Crux from the Crux Weaver armor, and then we just flail once and we're at three Crux again. It's actually really nice when it all lines up like that. So it's really good for defense, but that little bonus makes it not a terrible offensive option as well. And I know most of you are probably used to seeing a bunch of parses at the end of these videos, but I'm going to do a little something different here for this one. Instead of having them here in my video, I'm going to recommend some other YouTubers out there who already have some nice trial dummy tests to showcase for update 40. And in these, you'll be able to see their full rotation. I'll have the links to all of these in the description below. So first up, we have Rai. He typically has a variety of parses that he'll post for each major update. Definitely recommend checking out his YouTube channel. He got really great results 
results for update 40 on the Arcanist, as well as many other classes. Then we have Charles. He also posted a very nice Arcanist parse for update 40. Generally has a lot of great results for each patch for the classes that he does test. His clip was also featured in 8 Puppies Stamina Arcanist DPS guide. Super thorough in-game guide for the Arcanist there as well. I'm sure he touched on some points that I didn't. So if you are looking to dig a little bit deeper into what the Arcanist can do, I definitely recommend checking out his video there as well. Again, all three of these will be linked in the description below. So I hope this helped give you some good ideas for your Arcanist DPS. And remember, these are just a handful of ways to set up. Lots of encounters call for different loadouts. You should always adjust as needed for your situation. And again, this is available in written format on my website at skinnycheeks.gg. I appreciate y'all being here and watching this. If you want to connect further with me and other players, definitely recommend joining the Discord server. I'll have linked in the description below. Big shout out to my current Patreon supporters and YouTube members. The contributions help a ton to keep the website and YouTube channel going. And a special thanks to Nicholas, Simon, Cougars Bay and the Cougar City Guild, the Order of War Guild, Cantankerous Cat, Shady, Iffy, Blake1816, Mordecai1212, Santanico, Vadridi, Florian, Phoenix, Nalandia, Unemployed, Cresceliana, Cha Cha, Technical KO, Cat Danco77 and Pletbron. Thanks again and see you later. Uh bye.